one of the first things I asked Rio was, you know, like I've noticed he doesn't have shoes. He walks barefoot. This, this sort of like theme of being grounded that kind of starts with literally being grounded. Yeah, well, it's, uh, we have more to have contact with our environment. Like the feet are a major uh, way of doing that. And um, I think the fact that most people wear shoes all the time is probably uh, one of the major elements of disconnection that humans have from, from our environment. Version of my hair. Hello everyone, Chowan here. And today I am actually an hour outside of Melbourne and I'm with Oriel. Hello. Yeah, I'm actually in Oriel's studio. Uh, temporary living space and, uh, and temple as well. So mm. combined temple. space. <laughs> yeah. So right now we're sitting in front of this altar and you have several altars, but I wanted to do sort of like a tour of all the altars in his temple space in his art studio. And you were talking about uh, Kali and other, and I see some like uh, Egyptian Except yeah, well, this is actually a kind of combined altar because mm -hmm. uh, my main base now is actually in uh, Belgium. So, you know, a few of them have their own small shrines, but uh, the rest are all on this uh, altar together. I'm quite uh, eclectic and syncretic in my practices anyway, so it feels okay for me to um, to do that. So I've got Artemis Multinomia, which I got at Ephesus, uh, where the original is, and uh, a Sekhmet and Ptah from... Uh, Egypt over there, they're the two main uh, Egyptian deities that I work with. Um, there's also the weighing of the heart up here. But this image here is uh, by Amidali, because that's not one of my artworks. You know, some uh, deity figures that I've picked up in my travels, you know, in India and in Egypt and stuff, other things, things that I've made. Others are just interesting pieces of wood that I've found or, you know, different objects. So some of them have uh, more traditional or cultural resonance and other ones have uh, more of a, a natural uh, spirit of place kind of resonance. Or, you know, Why work um, with these deities? I mean, is it for art? Is it for... Well, there's not really uh, a great deal of difference for me um, anymore uh, between art and magic. Um, the two, I think, are very aligned anyway. For me, art is an expression of uh, my magical realities. It's a way of, uh, it's one way of earthing uh, things from, from other planes of existence into the physical. It's all kind of a mesh for me, the art and the magic. It's not like I'm uh, uh, directly doing something with this altar or these deities uh, to, you know, aid a particular artwork or anything. It's more like... Uh, my uh, my devotion to the deities it informs my life and my art uh, you know i do do specific rituals with my art sometimes where I'll, i will invoke a particular deity if i'm or evoke uh, a particular deity if I'm, but uh, yeah generally it's not that specific especially lately i've been doing a lot of uh, a lot more subconscious art where I just see what comes through. So I guess mm -hmm. then just my general magical practices and rituals and uh, devotional practices uh, inform that on all sorts of levels that I might not be fully aware of until it uh, starts emerging on the canvas or whatever the chosen medium may be. One of the things that um, Aidan Walker says in his book Six Ways is the aesthetics, they are inherently magical like if your altar feels beautiful to you then it just automatically becomes magical yeah yeah i think aesthetics and uh, um, magic are very entwined um, but a lot of people denigrate that or they seem to kind of say oh you know like real magic aesthetics don't matter i always bring this up about how everyone shits on like these new witches mainly female who come in because they love the witch aesthetic well, I have mixed feelings about it because it's, I love that aesthetic as well. And, uh, you know, I'd still probably appreciate that uh, even if there's people walking around uh, just using this as some kind of, um, you know, fashion, 
I'd rather than that than everyone looking around, uh, walking around looking really boring in mass produced clothes or whatever. So um, even if they're not uh, right into <laughs> into the uh, into their practices, and it is, it's just a surface thing. It's you know, it's still um, it's still an interesting one. Um, but you know, I much prefer it, of course, if um, people are, are really engaged with uh, with where the aesthetic comes from. And, were you yeah. always a witchy person? Uh, yeah, I guess so. I wouldn't have always called it that or been conscious of that's what it was uh, like in, as a child because I had a very conservative background in the backwaters of Perth. But, um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think so in, a, in an essential way, yes. I mean, I was always attracted to other worlds and uh, archetypes and, I remember as a child, you know, loving the Greek and Norse myths and, and everything, but uh, it was presented to me as something uh, fictional uh, as a child. And, you know, then I was into things like Lord of the Rings, which is, you know, of course, based on primarily on Norse mythology. And, uh, you know, all these things were considered to be something uh, fictional or, or fantasy. Um, you know, they weren't... Uh, considered related to the the real world um, <laughs> at all and it was only sort of like you know in my mid-teens um, that I actually began to discover that they were actually you know people uh, giving these things uh, validity in in the physical world and in the modern world and, and going no like uh, magic is, is still a reality it's not just a a thing of uh, ancient times or, or mythology, but it, it was yeah discovering that oh, actually there is a culture or, or a subculture of uh, people who who acknowledge the spirit in our modern Western society. And there's countries such as India where everyone still has that uh, that spirituality, but uh, in the in the modern West that's been lost to most people. And so it seems like uh, media and and art is like one of the only sort of outlets left for expression of that. And that's why I think uh, art, in particularly in our society, is inherently magical. It's just that uh, a lot of artists are not uh, recognising that or, or not, in, you know, not acknowledging it, so not uh, consciously going into the magical side of, of it. But the creative act in itself you know, is, is magic. So what sort of magical practice do you do on a daily basis? On a daily basis, uh, that changes all the time. Uh, I go through different periods of my life and I'm focused on different things. Um, I mean, I have, uh, I have consistent daily practices uh, like uh, yogic practices and chanting and stuff that, uh, you know, you could call, well, I, I find them magical, but they're not necessarily like rituals as such, um, except, you know, by their consistent, like repetitive nature. But um, there's, they're, they're definitely daily practices. Um, in terms of, you know, actually doing ritual that uh, fluctuates, I go through periods where I do a lot of ritual and periods where I don't do very much at all. And, um, it really has a lot to do with what artistic project I'm working on uh, because if I'm really obsessively engaged with some particular artistic project, I much, might not do so much magical ritual as such in itself and yet the actual process of creating the yeah. artwork is in itself a magical process and really I'm really is. going into a zone with that. And so, you know, I'm as much in a, uh, a magical space during those periods, uh, if not more so than those when I'm not, uh, you know, creating manifest artworks but doing more more ritual. I was watching this video of Grant Morrison talking about he created a hyper sigil where the comic that he was creating, it actually came true in his life. So I wrote this comic book, and as I wrote it, it became true. Things I would make the characters do became true. The main character was, uh, I gave him a bald head and a leather jacket because I thought people would like me when they read the comic. And uh, bald heads were really uncool back in 1992. <clears throat> and it worked. I found that if, uh, if I put the character through a situation where he was being tortured, where his lungs had burst and he was being held in captivity and subjected to all these awful things, 
Three months later, I'm in hospital, two burst lungs, <laughs> dying of blood poisoning and facing exactly the same shamanic trial that I put my character through. Has that happened to you before? Uh, yeah, my life is a constant stream of, uh, of interaction between my, my artworks and things which are manifesting in my life. And they, uh, they cross-pollinate each other as well because it's like sometimes I'll be doing you know, art that then creates a manifestation in my life. Other times something in my life will feed back into my art or you, know, you can come in and out of those zones and uh, you know, ultimately there's not really any barriers anymore. It's all art and, and magic and life. And because I work in a lot of media, it's uh, fascinating for me in that way as well. And I think that's why I don't want to stick to just one particular media or avenue of expression is because uh, something will naturally turn into something else. You know, like I might have a, a poem that suddenly becomes a song that then becomes a play that then becomes a film or, you know, a drawing that uh, becomes a sculpture or... Um, becomes a play or you know, it's like the the gods and spirits involved in the in the stories and in, in the uh, creations are you know their own their own spirits kind of uh, imbibe the work and to some degree direct it as well you know in Greek mythology they would always invoke a muse so for you you're saying gods and spirits so do you feel that when you're doing art, it's not you, it's the spirits? Well, it's both. Yeah, it's, I mean, you know, they're coming through my hands and my mind and, you know, my body, my voice, whatever, according to the media. So uh, I can't deny I have a, a, a part in it. Um, you know, I don't believe in the idea of pure channeling where something's directly from the spirits or the gods. It's like... Of course, you know, anyone who's going to channel it is any mm -hmm. vessel is going to um, affect what comes through. And so, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm not uh, ever going to deny my, my own uh, engagement with that, my, my part in and, you know, my ego's part in what comes through. But to varying degrees, you know, to varying degrees, it's... Um, you know more of me and and more of them and but ultimately if i'm really in the zone there's there's uh that sense of separation between uh what i'm what's coming through me and what's coming from me is it, it, that separation kind of dwindles sometimes anyway it's only... you don't struggle with creative block no <laughs> if anything i have the opposite problem um i usually have so many kind of ideas and inspirations that i have uh trouble actually earthing them or getting them through I might be like working on something and then I'm through the initial creative inspirational aspect of it and then I'm in the the finishing uh earthing you know getting it turning it into a product or a, a something more refined and actually getting it out into the world that stage of it that's not necessarily as enjoyable or, or directly creative it's hard to sometimes follow through with them because in the meantime uh the creative process so far or some other ritual i've been doing will be uh creating something else and so it's like this constant oh i'm, I'm doing this and and it's not finished but oh and now there's this and now there's this and so like sometimes i have to really like say you know just uh, just pause. wait to, to <laughs> some of the uh other things that want to come through because i i have to get this one done but uh, also often I don't, I don't always push it. I do go through uh, fellow periods of like uh, not being so creative for a while, um, particularly when I'm traveling or, you know, I don't have my own space for a while. Um, I'm garnering a lot of inspiration and, and processing things internally but not necessarily creating things in a, um, a more manifest way. And, you know, I have period, if, if I have a period where I don't really have a, a great inspiration to be creative then I don't um, I just don't <laughs> I do something else you're just following the natural rhythm yeah as much as possible with a bit of you know a bit of pushing and shoving and directing with the wheel <laughs> here and there but uh, as, as little as possible so let's say hypothetical situation a young artist comes to you and they're looking for magic to help them 
what would you suggest? Well, it really depends on the project. I mean, I think it's good to, if you want to do rituals specifically for a creative project, you'd really need to hone on what other spirits or deities most relevant to what you're doing and its expression and, uh, you know, find the, the motives, find the right channel um, and then, uh, you know, in, evoke or invoke those those deities or spirits uh, specific to the work. It's interesting you mentioned that about the muses earlier because uh, I'm actually uh, doing that currently in my main project lately is this uh, Solvay Coagula uh, film, my first feature film that I'm doing. <laughs> And um, it is based on a, a Greek classic, that of Orpheus. And the Greek classics always, uh, as you said, began with a, an invocation of the muse and the one most relevant to the work, uh, which is why I was saying, like, you know, I mean, whether it's a, a muse or if you're into Greek, uh, that, that pantheon um, or paradigm or, or something else, but just, uh, you know, the the archetypes or the energies which are most relevant to, to call them even if they're not directly uh a part of the work i've actually been invoking the the muse and i have the opening sequence for my film um, is an invocation of the the muse most relevant uh, to that particular work which is Arato, the uh, muse of uh lyric and erotic poetry so So the two statues are. Well, this is Dionysus and Dionysus. this is Canonus. The original of this, I sculpted them out of wax first and then had that cast uh, in bronze. And this one was uh, actually made, I made this at my place in Belgium on uh, May Day, so Beltane in the Northern Hemisphere at my place in Belgium. Oh. And I felt uh, the spirit of Canonos, like the antlered, the Celtic horn god, very strongly. Uh, at that land since I first arrived and done several rituals with uh, Kananas there. Mm. And uh, on May Day, like on Beltane, uh, I'd done a, a ritual the night before uh, where I was uh, spinning uh, Widdish shins around a fire uh, for Walpurgis night, mm -hmm. calling the spirits of the land and making offerings to them. And I planned the ritual for days because the the full moon actually fell on the the Beltane date as well, which mm -hmm. is uh, interesting. And I just got back to this uh, new new land of mine, and uh, and so I was doing a a ritual to really you know, engage with the spirits of the place. And uh, Kanonos was of course one of the deities I called because it's Celtic land, and and I had this rapport with that energy there. And uh, at the end of the ritual. Uh, I got some gnosis, but not a really deep one. It had been hard to do the ritual because I'd planned it for days and then there ended up being a big storm that night. And uh, so I was out there in the rain and the wind spinning around this fire. I had to light the fire inside and then take it outside to the ritual circle with a, a, a shovel. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, spinning around it in the in the rain, in the storm, um, which was really interesting and really kind of apt for Walpurgis night. And... Um, uh, but yeah, also quite difficult. And uh, at the end, I was quite uh, quite exhausted, and I felt a bit of gnosis, but uh, not a really deep one. And so I just went, okay, I guess that was it, and uh, went to sleep. But then the next day, uh, at e in the evening, I just felt compelled to make this uh, sculpture uh, to make the original wax for it. And I was just went into trance and created it very quickly uh, with the wax in about two or three hours. Not all the details, but the basic form of it. And um, then I, <clears throat> yeah, I, towards the end of it, I was starting to feel really tired. And um, like I wanted to stop and go to sleep. 
but I felt compelled to just keep going and, and I couldn't stop until the, the basic shape was finished. And then when it was finished, I was like, okay, that's done. Now I can finally go to sleep. I lay down and I didn't go to sleep at all. I just uh, went into this incredible uh, visionary state. Um, and it was it was kind of unexpected because it was the night after the ritual, but I guess it was some kind of uh, delayed effect. Um, you know, with the the Kanonos invocation and also uh, asking the spirits of the land like to really connect with them because it was all very floral. It was all it was all plants. It's the most actually the most uh, hallucinatory and kind of psychedelic experience I've had in my life without actually having any sacraments. <laughs> I was completely straight and sober and uh, just suddenly had these uh, open eye visions that were very. Uh, very vivid and, and very uh, very kind of psychedelic, almost uh, ayahuasca-like uh, mandalas of plants and leaves, and so it was really like, okay, so this is the this is the spirits of the land. It's it's the plants here. It makes sense in this little concentrated patch of forest. So that was that was an incredible experience, and that was uh, that was all very much entwined with this uh, the creation of this horned god figure, who I've only just uh, finally cast. Four or five months later, uh, on return to Australia, where I have a good connection with the foundry here. So here we are with uh, Dionysus. But since it's witches and wine, and we're talking about Dionysus, I thought it was important. So, cheers, Dionysus. Yeah, Dionysus. Yeah, Dionysus. <laughs> Dionysus. This is what you do. You just think. yeah. It's his little uh, cornucopia. Nice. This is fun. I feel like I'm in a sleepover. Uh, Dionysus is particularly pertinent to the work I'm doing at the moment for the uh, the film that I'm doing. In fact, uh, wine also is because uh, Dionysus represented the spirit of the of the wine and of the vine. Mm -hmm. And um, the story of Orpheus that I'm working with in the Solve Coagula film, he was uh, torn apart by the Maenads. <laughs> And uh, in my film, the myth is taken further, where he gets a he creates a new body for himself as the uh, Baphomet head uh, centuries later. And um, that uh, being torn apart and and reconstructed, that's very central to the the myth of Dionysus uh, himself. And it's interesting because the Orphic uh, mysteries became uh, later sort of separated from the uh, Dion Dionysian mysteries and uh, considered a separate uh, current and that was kind of furthered by the uh, Nician idea that uh, Nician idea that um, there was the Apollonian and the which is uh, you know very mental and, and cosmic and the music of the spheres and the Dionysian very earthy um, elemental kind of uh, magic and yet the the Orphic uh, mysteries and the uh, Dionysian mysteries were actually originally entwined, which is something I realised a few years ago when I was in Bulgaria, because uh, Bulgaria is kind of a probably the main origin of Dionysus, uh, Zagreus, uh, thousands of years before the classical Dionysus, and uh, Orpheus was apparently originally a Thracian king. Um, so uh, all the all the kings in Thrace were considered avatars of Dionysus, and they were uh, ritually sacrificed um, at the moment of orgasm, so that the spirit of Dionysus what, would, wait, what? would go. They'd like have a um, a ritual uh, where the um, the king would be in conjunction with a priestess, and at the moment of orgasm, they would sacrifice the king. The idea, idea being that the spirit of Dionysus, uh, whom the king embodied during his reign, would then go into the child as the next king and the next avatar of Dionysus. And so I realised, well, if Orpheus was actually an avatar of Dionysus, then you know the uh, the currents aren't so separate as they later became in classical and post-classical times. And then the myth of Orpheus actually makes a lot more sense because uh, he was torn apart because he was an avatar of Dionysus who was also torn apart to reform and uh, 
what that represents is the crushing of the grapes, the blood of Dionysus. I'm, I'm sure most of my audience, they know about the myth of Orpheus up to the point where I know, which is Orpheus had a wife and she went down to Hades and then he was like a famous minstrel and then he went down to try to get her. Something didn't go right. And then what happened? Well, what didn't go right was that uh, she was dead and he wasn't so... He wasn't supposed to go into the underworld for a start without being dead, but he uh, he made such a fuss <laughs> about it uh, with his laments that eventually they let him in and uh, eventually they did let him back out with Eurydice, his uh, wife, um, who died on their, their wedding day. He wasn't supposed to look back um, to make sure that, he, that she was uh, following him back to the upper world and of course he had his little moment of doubt of the wrong moment and um yeah looked back and she fell back into the underworld uh the end of the story is that uh yeah years later he was wandering in the forest still lamenting for Eurydice's loss and um the nomads uh, who, the wild women um in the retinue of Dionysus so they're kind of like uh, wild women of the forest uh, in the mountains and um, they tore Orpheus limb from limb. wondering why they tore Orpheus apart and I realized that it's probably because he wasn't really present because they're so you know they're primal and they're just uh, in tune with the immediate the physical the forest the rocks the trees the animals and they couldn't understand this being who was immortal and physical and yet wasn't um, present in the moment and in his body he was still lamenting uh, that he was left in the earth plane and that he'd lost to Eridici and so he wasn't able to appreciate this um, immortality he'd been granted and, and they couldn't understand why he wasn't, why he was basically just a singing head so they thought okay you want to be just a singing head you can just be that and, and so they got rid of his body which he wasn't apparently using anyway and uh, he became literally just a singing head as a touched on before that I kind of discovered later after my initial personal interpretation of it is that as an avatar of Dionysus that uh, that tearing apart makes sense in terms of then if he's later reformed it's like um, just the way all things are cyclical that uh, you know death is only a part of the journey of transformation and that you have to totally destroy and crush the grapes underfoot to make the wine is the blood of Dionysus and uh, therefore of his avatar Orpheus. That reminds me of like in Bali when I, I see some flowers here, some blossoms. The um, flowers, the frangipani, when they come down from the trees, I mean, it happens naturally. They're no longer on the tree. They've fallen. They're at their most beautiful, I feel, when they fall because they're the most full. They're the most ripe. And yet that's when they die. At their greatest potency, they died. Yeah. And of Orpheus, I mean, after wandering around for so many years, lamenting and singing, was there any talk in the legend about his singing being so next level beautiful at that point with that his head was saved simply because they were just like, wow. Well, the the traditional, like the classical version of the myth has it that... Um... Uh, that the reason that uh, Orpheus actually was able to get into the underworld and allowed to take Eurydice back, which is a complete uh, transgression of the usual laws of uh, of life and death, uh, that he was able to do that because he sang so beautifully but also so emotively about his lost love that eventually uh, Hades and Persephone relented. Um, I've kind of recontextualised that myth a bit in my film, um, which is probably one of the more humorous and absurd aspects of it because uh, I was finding a challenge to play Orpheus. I mean, I think I'm quite a good singer. 
uh, but to play the part of the the best, the greatest bar that ever was. <laughs> you know, that archetype I was right. like, wow, that's like, how the fuck am I going to do that? You know, and, uh, you know, no matter how much post-production I can do in the music or whatever and, you know, underlaying, you know, instruments and all the rest, um, it's definitely challenging. And uh, you know, I thought of this other angle on the myth that kind of like let me off the hook a bit and that's uh, just that he was actually just so relentless uh, with his uh, his lamentation that it was I was not dead yet went to the gates of the world of the dead that eventually uh, he managed to um, just so willful about it that he just wanted uh, Udici back so much that he just wouldn't uh, let up until he got what he wanted. We're here in front of a statue of Baphomet. And I think a lot of my audience are probably just like, oh, you mean like Sabrina the Teen Witch, you know? How, uh, what was it, that satanic order they sued? Oh yeah, I saw something about that just the other day. But the actual statue they created, I don't really feel was properly representative of Baphomet because it was uh, missing the feminine aspect, which I think is integral because uh, Baphomet's not Satan, it's not the devil, it's um, it's like a, it's a hermaphroditic deity and uh, to me it's like a... a hermaphroditic kind of uh, aspect of, of Pan in a way, it's like it's like the horned god and the uh, the horned goddess together. It's like the primal uh, element, uh, animal and uh, uh, sexual and sensual aspect of, of humanity, but the feminine as well as the, the more uh, masculine aspect of Pan um, represented by this horned being. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And uh, it, it, it needs to be represented uh, hermaphroditically because... Uh, Baphomet also represents uh, the the emergence of of polarities and the ultimate ultimately the transcendence of those uh, um, those divisions because it's uh, it's you know it's uh, animal it's it's divine it's uh, angel and demon if you like it's got wings as well as horns it's um, and so also needs to be both male and female if to represent that uh, that that uh, merging of, of polar elements. As Oriel was talking about, just Baphomet stands like sort of at the crossroads of so many different polarities, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, but I think in Sabrina, they were just using it as a satanic symbol. Yeah. I mean, it's it's it. used by the Church of Satan, very other, various other satanic churches like... Uh, and obviously it looks, you know, it looks like the devil because it has horns and a goat head and hoofs and the rest. But that image in the first place of the, the Christian image of the devil is actually a, a already a, in itself a mis misappropriation of, of Pan, um, you know, who was just the ancient pagan god of the body of sexuality, of the earth, you know, all those things that the Christians considered to be bad and evil. So, you know, they uh, used used these uh, aspects in their iconography of, of their image of evil. But, of course, if you don't believe that the body and the earth and sexuality and all these uh, wonderful things are, are evil, then... Uh, you know, it's it's not a uh, a, a bad figure. <laughs> it's not a not an evil figure at all. So you know, having the um, the candle between the the or the torch between the uh, horns is also like uh, you know the transcendental, the the divine illumination. So it's the whole like, and also the gestures of the hands, the the as above, so below. Solve a coagula. It's very much about um, you know the earthly and the and the cosmic, the uh, manifest and the ethereal, all being um, merged. And uh, you've mentioned into that several thing. times now. Solve a coagula. Mm -hmm. What is that exactly? Um, well, the reason I mention it now is because it's it's traditionally written on the arms of uh, a Baphomet in the, in the classic uh, drawing uh, um, from Eliphas Levi, um, and it's a. Uh, 
it's uh, Latin for basically dissolve and coagulate, so to come apart and reform. Um, same as what I was saying before about like with the grapes uh, making the wine, it's like things being um, destroyed to create a, a new form, uh, to distill something to its, its more essential form. And that's also the name of film yeah and uh that for several reasons partly because of that uh, distillation process in relation to the dionysian mysteries but also because it's also um concerns baphomet the second act of the film is uh set centuries later uh in the middle ages where the uh the singing mortal head of orpheus which i always wondered what happened to um, since it's immortal, when I first heard the tale, um, in in my film uh, and the play it was based on, uh, it becomes uh, the head, the Baphomet head that the Knights Templar purportedly uh, took Oracle from the Baphomet, they called it, um, in some of the accounts, um, was actually a head, in some versions a human head, uh, possibly the head of John the Baptist, um, uh, or sometimes a goat head, which also relates to the Dionysian mysteries. This idea uh, that's intrinsic to the film is that this uh, this was actually a mortal head of Orpheus uh, that they took their oracle from, and um, you know he basically learnt a lot from being a disembodied yet immortal head. <laughs> Yes, and decides uh, in this story to create for him herself a new body. There's a there's a metaphor in the story in that uh, he's actually creating a new body uh, via uh, his vicarious experience of others enjoying their bodies. So he's telling people, you know, you should be in your body, you should enjoy your body, and then. Um, these people enjoying their bodies and each other's bodies and uniting with each other actually create his body. So there's this image of the new body being formed from all these little bodies uh, joining together to form the larger body. Um, so, yeah, it's like this composite uh, sculpture I'm making um, or recreating because I originally made it for the play. And, um, yeah, now it's uh, it's like a, a life-size abdomen and arms of Baphomet that's created from all these little figures, little wax figures in the film. They're stop animated and um, come together to form this, um, to form the, the new body. How we started off this conversation, uh, discussing how artists are inherently magical and that the role in modern society that artists play is to bring that spirit world into just mundane reality it's like the the last sort of vestige or last place in the secular society where that can be brought in what sort of magical um, lessons and magical message do you want to send through this film uh that uh that spirit is all around us that it's that it's in the earth that it's in nature that it's in the elements that it's not just something separate um, you know, off in heaven or off in other world or other realms that we need to really uh, be in our bodies and appreciate uh, the physical world and the physical senses and um, make the most of them. Huge uh, uh ways of looking at reality are kind of like two extremes of separation, I think, um, where we have one where there's like all the focus is on spirit without matter and the other one where it's all on the stuff but it has it has no life um it's just stuff to collect or whatever um and uh yeah i think we need to reintegrate that to realize that no, actually the world around us is you know imbibed and animated with spirit it's everything is in sold and that uh we need to appreciate that again and um you know, have respect for the material world rather than, um, you know, destroy it. The thing about witchcraft and paganism is that they're intrinsically earth religions and they recognize the physical world as and, and matter as being the house of, of spirit and um, that's it.
that's an important, important thing. Okay, so this is the car that we've rented this lifetime to drive around in. Be nice to the car, give it good gasoline, right? Clean the carpet once in a while. <laughs> Especially this blue red wine. <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome. So I don't know if I captured this on video, but yeah, Ariel, he was just walking about and then knocked over like half the glass of wine onto the floor to the carpet. But you know, Dionysus half was just bottle. like half the bottle, right? <laughs> so actually, Oriol, can you tell us more about your Kickstarter? Ah, yeah. I'm doing a Kickstarter for the post-production of the film. I did one initially a year ago um, to get the project going. The original vision of the production has extended considerably. Like the actual process of creating it has uh, been very inspiring and going really well so far, but I've kept having more and more ideas. Um, like I was talking about before about the, you know, the... Sometimes I feel like I have to curtail my creativity to actually get things manifested. Um, some of the ideas I had for the film, I was like, no, it's already <laughs> big and complex enough. It's already yeah. a feature film. I don't need to add any more extra scenes and everything. But like some of these uh, ideas just had a life of their own and um, were insistent in being included. And so, um, yeah, eventually I, I surrendered to the the whims of the the gods and the fates and um and there's some some extra scenes that are actually uh going really well and now seem really intrinsic to it so. yeah everything that we've been talking about in this interview like literally everything we've been talking about um it's part of the film the film is not just actors there's also clay animation um it's just wax but yeah, yeah well, stop cool. animation stop animation <laughs> oopsies <laughs> and um there's music there's, of course, the visuals. And yeah, guys, it's another five days until the Kickstarter ends. And it would be fabulous if you enjoy this interview and you like this concept of respecting material with spirit. And, you know, I think Dionysus was just like, yep, you know, that wine that was spilled was his way of kind of blessing it as well. If you guys want to support it, I'll definitely put the links down below. So offered a, a lot of um, a lot of good rewards like... Uh books and prints and original art and all sorts of things. Even if you um, if you can't help with the film, I hope you still uh, follow the link and uh, have a look at the preview and information about it anyway. And I hope you enjoy it. That's the main thing. Oriel talked about, you know, he doesn't just do this or that. He, he's like multidisciplinary in terms of art. I just wanted to show some pictures in his book. It's in Distillatio. That's the last in a series of four books uh, pub that fully published. Uh, the so, Tele Quadrivium series. So basically, I noticed a lot of alchemy terms here. So. Yeah, yeah. Each there's four books: a red one. I haven't got the red one and the black one here at the moment, but uh, there's a red one, a black one, a white one, and a gold one, and they each represent an alchemical phase. Look at this. There you go. That's Baphomet again. You but, can um, get them on eBay for a ridiculously price, ridiculous oh. prices from resellers if you want to. <laughs> oh, and there's like gold parts right here. So, guys, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and Oriel, thank you so much for inviting me to your studio. Thank you for and, me. Yeah, sure. and showing me all of your great artwork. And uh, there's also that Kickstarter that's going to end in, well, by the time this video is out in not many days. <laughs> One or two. What are your thoughts about <coughs> spirit and material being together? What are your thoughts about what it means to be fully embodied to do great magic? And do you struggle with creative blocks? And how do you think magic can help you overcome them? So see you again next time. Bye, guys.